Hello and welcome. We have a very important and interesting show for you tonight, and a very interesting guest. I'm sitting tonight with Zina Polets gutmanis and she's a Minneapolis resident who is Ukrainian-American. She is writing a book about Ukrainian life and immigration here. She is the producer-director of a documentary that uh, I have not seen, but I've heard a lot about that sounds very important. It's called Ola Demar, and um, it's tying into memories, and I'm going to have her give you a lot more about that. Um, we're taping on January 8th, 2024, and I only mention that date because the world is in such turmoil, and there are so many things happening. So if you see this later, there may be shifts in questions and answers, you know, from, from today, January 8th. Well, Zena, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Mary. We're going to kind of cover a lot of different things about Ukraine, about Ukrainian Americans, about Northeast Minneapolis, um, and about uh, some history that, that uh, We'll, we'll go into. So, as I read the papers every day, Zina, I am so worried about Ukraine right now, and I'm wondering how you, as a Ukrainian American, are looking at the situation, and and how are you kind of um, dealing with it? It's very difficult, Mary, and I really hope that. American lawmakers are able to come to agreement on whatever they need to do to fund Ukraine so that it's not unfunded because of pol political disagreements. Yeah, they're almost, some of the lawmakers are using Ukraine as kind of a bartering deal, it seems like, um, in terms of getting uh, border security changed in our country, and I'm guessing that's got to be extremely um, concerning, frustrating, makes you angry. Well, it is frustrating, and I understand how, you know, Congress works, but the Ukrainian people deserve our support, yeah. and I'm in touch with my own family in Ukraine. I have an aunt and uncle, and they came out of retirement. Uh, they were medical professionals. They came out of retirement to practice their specialties to help wounded soldiers and civilians. And so they're working full time now. Oh, where are they? What, what? In Kiev, in the oh, capital. They are. Okay. And then uh, I have a cousin who's in central Ukraine. So he's he's far from the fighting, but his family, his the men in his family, have joined the territorial defense force, and he had. A situation happened where a family that was internally displaced, so their house in eastern Ukraine had been destroyed, and they were traveling west. And they, you know, he met them, and he said, "Well, you can just stay at our house." Mm -hmm. And so he took in strangers, and so people are really just pulling together and trying to build, you know, back their society in every way that they can, and they're contributing so much and. It, it's inspirational for me, and it feels like we need to do more. And I think the whole world is kind of on edge about it, and a lot of countries realize that, you know, we are a small world, and we better stick together and support each other. Yes. Um, so when you say some of your relatives are out of the, the uh, most intense area, the feeling I'm getting, though, as I read the paper about the drones and the missiles that are hitting in western Ukraine and Kyiv, and um, is any place really safe there? Nowhere is truly safe, yeah. and um, nowhere nowhere is truly safe. And one thing that really I disagree with is people who say, "Well, Ukraine should trade land for peace," mm. because in 1993. Ukraine signed the Budapest Memorandum and traded away its nuclear weapons 
in order that the US, the UK, and Russia would recognize its borders. And as you know, that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. And there are people that are living in those occupied territories that are Ukrainian citizens. One, you know, we all saw the images and the footage of those atrocities in the city of Bucha mm -hmm. and that beautiful big church and then the mass graves. Mm -hmm. Well, did you know that the minister at the Bucha church has a relationship with St. Michael's and St. George's Ukrainian Orthodox Church in Northeast Minneapolis? Really? They are sister parishes. Really? And in fact, that, that priest came to Minneapolis in 2000 and had dinner at my parents' home. Oh my goodness. So, you know, we had, we had a relationship with them and then to see what happened there yeah. and to see what, you know, he, had, he was forced to become a spokesperson to all the world media because all of his parishioners, you know, were suffering terribly or had died mm -hmm. and were in these mass graves and they were trying to give them, you know, a decent burial. So it really does hit close to home. Oh, it's very close to home, isn't it? Uh huh. Very close to home. Where did your family um, basically or mostly live uh, when you think of grandparents and aunts and uncles and your parents? Where did they live in, in Ukraine? Sure. Uh, my father's family came from central Ukraine. Okay. And my mother's family came from eastern Ukraine in the Kharkiv region. Okay. And um, they were, ex and during World War II, there was a lot of people who, just like this lady who ended up at my cousin's house, they were internally displaced and they were getting pushed west to, f uh, to flee the fighting. Or also many uh, Ukrainian people were kidnapped by the Nazis and turned into slave laborers mm -hmm. in Germany. No, I did not know that part so, of history. After the war, there were a lot of Ukrainians and other ethnicities milling around Germany and Austria, and the United Nations was overseeing these camps, displaced persons camps. And Harry Truman uh, signed the Displaced Person Act of 1948 that allowed a certain number of displaced people of all nationalities to come to the U.S. And uh, my family was, my family's because my parents were just children and didn't know each other, mm -hmm. um, were lucky that they were able to come they here. They were one of the, the yes. families who got to come. Yes. So it's your, your mother's family and your father's family. Yes. Both, and did they both end up in Minneapolis? Yes, they did. How was Minneapolis chosen by so many Ukrainians? I'm curious about that. Well, it was a smaller community, actually. Many Ukrainians w ended up in the large Eastern I'm thinking cities, New York City, the, yeah, Chicago. and like also like Cleveland, the Rust Belt. There were a lot of jobs. Uh -huh. um, it was actually it was deliberate, and this is one of the things that I write about in my book. But there was a professor at the U, Alexander Granovsky, who also was a transplanted Ukrainian, uh -huh. and he wanted to ensure that educated and skilled people would find a way to Minnesota. Mm -hmm. So rather, a lot of people in the camps were trying to learn trades or anything that would, that would help them to earn a living. Uh -huh. Because maybe teaching Ukrainian history wouldn't necessarily be a job that they could do here. Uh -huh. And he wanted to make sure that those people didn't fall through the cracks. Mm -hmm. So he, he brought artists, and writers and scientists mm -hmm. to Minnesota. Wow, one man made a big difference yes. in Dinty. Is he, he's probably not still alive. No, he isn't. No, he wouldn't be. Um, so Northeast Minneapolis was the place. People didn't move to South Minneapolis or St. Paul nearly as much as, as Northeast, is that? I think that correct? Northeast was historically the place where the Catholic and the Orthodox Church had built their church buildings. Mm -hmm. And so many people lived near the church. Okay, and that then, makes sense. Yes. So sort of, yeah, the church became more than just 
a religious center, but a social center, I'm guessing. Yes. A community center. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Youth center. Yeah. Um, so you were born here in Minneapolis. Um, growing up, did you identify really strongly as a Ukrainian um, a person heritage-wise? Uh, well, I did. And a big part of that was because those displaced people who came here, they built structures so that to educate, I guess, uh, and, and help uh, support the next generation of Ukrainians to help fight for Ukraine's freedom. And so during the week, I was just your regular American child. And on the weekends, I was all Ukrainian. So I would go to Ukrainian dancing classes on Friday nights. I would go to Ukrainian heritage school on Saturday mornings and I learned history. I learned grammar, you know, singing. And then we had a youth group Saturday afternoon. Uh -huh. Then Sunday I went to church. And we then there, very, might, there, very might, be, much into the, the there might be like a concert or a social event just stuck in there too. So you just had all kinds of community support and uh, family feel, I bet. Immersion. That's a good word, yeah, immersion. Yeah, really. Is that feeling as strong now as it was when you were a little girl, or is it stronger um, or weaker? Well, that's a good question. Things really changed um, because, you know, we were just taught that Ukraine was under communism and we, we needed to help. We needed to help support the Ukrainian quest for independence any way that we could. And then in 1991, Ukraine declared independence and there was no fighting at all. And so a lot of the, I guess, structures and organizations uh, sure. relaxed right. and maybe decayed and the pressure was off. Yeah. And the motivation to do, do, do what you could it became, wasn't necessary. It, exactly. It became, it became more like any other, you know, ethnic mm -hmm. identification, mm -hmm. the culture. Food was probably continuing to be Sure, of course. Crafts, sure. you know. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe that relaxation came too soon. So this, this war has, and now there have been new immigrants. There are, pe there are people that came after independence, that came for economic reasons, and now we have these war refugees coming. Mm -hmm. For again, it's a political immigration. They mm -hmm. they were they wouldn't come otherwise if they if they weren't you know they at war. Wouldn't want to leave Ukraine, right? If they didn't have to. I'm, I'm guessing now. So so these people are going to have their own perspective. They're much closer to Ukraine than somebody who was born here, and they're going to want to do things you know, the way that they think is right. And that's, that's natural. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's how it should be. So, yeah, so shifts depending on what wave of, of uh, immigrants have been coming, right? Yes, and, and, what's, you, and what's happening in Ukraine. Right, of course, and that's the biggest driver, isn't it? Yes. Um, do we have a number in terms of about how many Ukrainian Americans or Ukrainians, period, we have here in the Twin Cities? I saw a census statistic. It was, I think, 15,000 mm -hmm. at the last census. Okay, 15,000. Okay, that's good to know. Um, I think we're all, well, most of us who live here in Minneapolis are familiar with some of the Ukrainian churches and the uh, wonderful restaurant or uh, cafeteria. Sure. Chicks. Um, and there was a great gift shop, and I don't know that if that is still around. It is now mail order, and uh, oh. it is the largest, the Ukrainian gift shop is the largest mail order source of Ukrainian Easter eggs in the world. Really? Yes. And it headquarters here? Yes. So are the people creating the eggs and the, the wonderful work all from here? No, but we preserved, because of Mrs. Marie Protsai, who was the founder of that gift shop, that, that 
craftsmanship and those techniques were preserved here. Oh. And so when I was growing up, if you found any Ukrainian child on the street and set them down and said, I want you to make a Ukrainian Easter egg, they'd be like, okay, and they'd start making one. Really? And so that, it was just something that, that we learned from a very young age. Oh, wow. And that wasn't necessarily true in Ukraine, and it wasn't even necessarily true in other cities in the U.S. Oh, interesting. It was very local. And again, one woman, mm -hmm. one person, really made a difference in terms of something that became much bigger. Yes. That is so interesting. Wow. Um, I just got the signal we're half done already, and there's so many questions I have for you, but I want to talk a bit about your documentary before we, we get too close to the end of the show, because um, it's a very powerful sounding, very hard to um, realize this went on kind of documentary. But briefly tell us um, what old Hula de Mar represents and tell us more about it. Sure. So the Holodomor was a artificially created famine genocide that was at its height in 1932 and 33 in Ukraine. And it was focused on Ukrainian farmers at the time, but really it began earlier. After Lenin died, Stalin wanted to bring the Ukrainian people, which he felt maybe were, I'm really simplifying, but they were independence-minded to bring them into line. So he, Ukrainians were a threat to his uh, order, in a well, sense. And, and they, you in, in know, not, not, not really, but just that they wanted to speak their language, be, be themselves. Mm -hmm. And so starting be in free. 19, <laughs> yes, Starting in 1927, um, Ukraine's intellectual, spiritual, and uh, cultural leaders were systematically eradicated, whether sent to prison, Siberia, mm -hmm. or executed. Starting in 27. Mm -hmm. Okay. The clergy, writers, artists, historians, you know, and then after that, they started going after the farmers. Um, for two reasons, and again, I'm simplifying, so I'm not a historian. Mm -hmm. um, I did work with a historian on my film, and I learned a lot. Uh, but they wanted to collectivize the farmers so that rather than being a bourgeois owner of a farm, which is bad, you would be a proletariat worker on a state-run farm, which was good. Mm. And so farmers were being incentivized to give away their farm and work as hired hands. On a larger piece of yes. land. And the thinking was that that would be more efficient and that then more money could be extracted from agriculture to industrialize the nation. And farmers that didn't go along were taxed very heavily after they couldn't pay their taxes their farms were confiscated, they were sent away, and uh, were labeled enemies of the state. Mm -hmm. So that was very stressful and terrible. Mm -hmm. And also cadres of active communists were coming in and just basically taking all the food from the collective farms and the other farms. And wasn't there already to start enough? a drought of famine that was part of the, the time? No. no, the growing season was, was normal, mm. but everything was being taken away. They would dig in people's wells, they, would, they, would, they had these long sticks and they would put them in their barn to see if they could, if they'd hidden any food. Mm. And they would just take the food. And millions of Ukrainian farmers died. I read three to 11 million people died in total. Yes, and That's the reason the range is so large is because records were either destroyed or taken to Moscow. So depending on how you're trying to find that number, people have different numbers that they come up with. Um, and that was a very traumatic experience. So now we're talking in the early 30s, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. It's just shocking to me almost 
very surprising that, that I didn't know anything about this, that people I'm talking to during the week about you know the show tonight, the interview tonight, didn't know about it. Um, Mary, I didn't know about it either because didn't. when I was a child, we studied history in Ukrainian school. I don't remember ever studying this. Really? And then um, in 1983 was the 50th anniversary, and that was the first time that I ever heard about it. I was young and I remember having family dinners or, or holidays and we would have people from the community over and they would sit at the end of the table and of course they would talk about all the people that they lost, family members, and they would get very sad and they would start crying and I'm just a little kid, this is supposed to be a joyous occasion, Christmas, I'm just a little girl, I'm just a little kid so I didn't understand it until I became older and learned about it more. For centuries, foreign powers laid claim to Ukraine's territory. At the start of the 20th century, Ukraine was divided, ruled by Russia in the east and the Austro-Hungarian Empire in the west. Yet Ukrainian farmers kept alive their Ukrainian language and ancient national traditions in spite of ongoing repression and neglect. In 1918, Ukraine celebrated a short-lived independence. A year later, Eastern and Western Ukraine were united for the first time in 300 years. But the army of the Ukrainian People's Republic faced enemies on all sides. Outmatched, Ukraine once again found itself divided, this time among Bolshevik Russia, Poland, Romania and Czechoslovakia. After the revolution, the Red Army confiscated Ukraine's agricultural output to feed Russian cities. But Bolshevik leader Lenin worried about keeping freedom-seeking Ukrainians under Moscow's control. Soviets were coming in and taking their land against their will. My grandfather was an elder in the village. They had an assembly meeting and he said, let's oppose this, let's, let's create an uprising. This isn't right, they can't take our land, they can't take our houses, our barns, our livestock, our crops. The Soviets heard about this, the Soviet communists, they jailed him and um, he escaped. They jailed him a second time and they beat his legs with the butt of a rifle so he would not escape. So till the day he passed away at age 93, he always had circulation problems in his legs. During the Great Depression, the Ukrainian community centered around two parishes, St. Michael's and St. Constantine's, just a few blocks away from each other. They held endless dinners, bake sales, bazaars to raise money for the Ukrainian cause. Two of the important places that they participated in where there was a larger audience was at the Festival of Nations and at the State Fair. Under Lenin's successor Stalin, the Communist Party introduced a five-year plan that forced private farmers to hand over their land, machinery, and farm animals to collective state-run farms. The state would use the revenues to pay for rapid industrialization. Mrs. Puchkovsky, or as we called her Pani Nila, because her Nila was her name. She was a dear, close friend of my mom's. Mrs. Puchkovsky is here, and that's my mom in, in the wheelchair. And the scarf that my mom is wearing is the, 
I, I saved it, and so I'm wearing it now to, to be able to to feel their closeness, feel their, their spirit as I share Mrs. Puchkowski's memories. The first thing I remember is the word collectivization, said in a whisper and with fear. My grandfather told my father to get a job on the railroad. He also said, and this struck us all like a thunderbolt, that he was giving away voluntarily his farmstead and land, cows, oxen, sleighs, and carriage to the collective farm. He said maybe with this action, they would leave us alone for a while. You have a system of farms being formed where the formerly independent farmer becomes basically a hired hand who has very little or no say in the affairs of the new collective farm that's being established. If you were a private farmer, in order to incentivize you to finally give up, you were taxed to death. If you were unable to meet your obligations, your land and possessions were subject to confiscation. Thank you.